Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. I know you guys have just been waiting for me to uh, preach again so that I can talk about uh, running analogies and the Boston Marathon. Uh, but you know, the, uh, the Boston Marathon is... Uh, a month away. Uh, it's really exciting. I mean, listen, if you live in Hopkinton, it's the only event <laughs> that uh, sort of brings Hopkinton on the map. Uh, and no matter where you travel in the world, you can always say, hey, we live at the starting place of the Boston Marathon. Because people often say, well, how do I get hold of you? you? I don't need to give you a card. Just look us up, you know, starting place, Boston Marathon. You can find us. But uh, I, I want to talk about the Shailene effect. This is uh, kind of interesting uh, uh, f- for me as a runner and for others, and, uh, but more because the Shailene effect has uh, become known for uh, um, a domino effect uh, in a positive way. So Shailene Flanagan uh, did something that was uh, sort of unthinkable in terms of women's marathon running. So in uh, uh, 20, uh, I think it was 17, she won the New York Marathon, and she was the first American female to win the marathon in 40 years. Okay, so for 40 years, American uh, female athletes were like, we just can't beat those Africans. It's just like, there's just no ways. Uh, just... And then all of a sudden, she wins. Well, this created what's called the Shailene effect. It created a a massive domino effect of uh, American females believing that they could actually uh, compete at the highest level. And so the following year in Boston, which was that miserable rainy uh, year of of racing, another woman, Deirdre, wins the Boston Marathon. It was like two in a row. It was like unbelievable. And then uh, for the Olympic uh, trials, they had the record number of female marathon runners qualifying for the the Olympic marathon trials. So much so that they had to raise the standard after that by eight minutes, which in running time is like a a, a massive raising of the bar. So, so many people qualified, so many people are doing so well, but that became known as the Shailene effect. There was this belief that it can happen, when you see it happen, when you see something that seemed impossible uh, in your area of interest becoming possible, when somebody makes a breakthrough, uh, there's something which is so uh, uh, inspiring that it draws us uh, to that. And I, uh, as we moving into the season, we, we're talking about Jesus moving towards the cross. Uh, but it's not just towards the cross, it's also to Easter Resurrection Sunday. There's this desire where Jesus is actually uh, put in place what Shailene could never have done, uh, but a domino effect, an inspirational effect, where Jesus has made disciples, which have made disciples, And Jesus has demonstrated a life that is absolutely miraculous, but so inspiring that it becomes believable to average people like you and I. And so we see people that are living it, and it's just very, very uh, inspiring. But more than that, uh, Jesus has come to implement a whole new um, worldview, a, a whole new world order. Uh, Jesus come to implement the kingdom of God. And uh, this whole build-up to Lent is this incredible implementation of Jesus' plan, the kingdom of God. And the big idea here is Jesus is saying, look, we need to reshape the way we think and who we are and understand who He is, who God is, that Jesus is God. And that Jesus came and lived on this earth. And Jesus came and did unbelievable miracles to prove that he is who he is for one purpose. That we could live a life where we put him first. Because we experience his love. We experience his joy. And we say this is the best possible way 
of living. And there's a desire in us as a result of that to want to worship Him. And as we do that, it's inspiring to others. And others say they want to worship Him. They want to see, they want to live a life that's fulfilled and meaningful and purposeful uh, because they see you and I living that kind of a life. So let me just, uh, even though we've prayed, I just pray, Lord Jesus, uh, do it today. Let your kingdom reign. Let your kingdom advance through us. Inspire us again, Lord. Uh, be personal with us today. Lift us up, uh, Lord Jesus. We desire to worship you. But Lord, we also desire to be your disciples. Uh, mold us in the way that you want us to be molded, Lord, so that we can be uh, a light in this world and that our joy in loving you and worshiping you becomes contagious to everybody that sees us and knows us. In your name, Jesus, amen. Uh, I'm going to be uh, preaching uh, today out of John uh, chapter 11. If you want to make your way there, uh, that would be helpful. I'm talking about Lazarus and how Lazarus was uh, raised from the dead by Jesus. Now, uh, this story comes in the context of uh, what has gone before, where in the Gospel of John, uh, John uses the word <clears throat> signs. And there's uh, six signs or miracles where Jesus has performed public demonstrations of um, who he is. The first one being the, the wedding in Cana where Jesus turns uh, water into wine. Uh, the second one is Jesus heals an official son at a distance, just commands the person to be healed and he's healed. Uh, the, the third one is Jesus heals a lame person, which everybody had seen, and it was like a spectacular public thing. It's like, okay, this guy is now all of a sudden healed. And Jesus just has these short prayers. Pick up your mat and walk. And the person responds. So the next um, uh, miracle that Jesus performs uh, is feeding 5,000. And after that, uh, Jesus, Jesus heals a man born blind. And, you know, again, there's no sort of rhyme or reason to how he does it. You know, the blind guy says, okay, I put some mud in your eyes, and I go wash it out in the pool, and you'll be healed. And he does, and he is. Uh, and then finally, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And again, very short prayer, Lazarus, come out. But in all of this, something phenomenal is happening. Jesus is doing what only Jesus can do. He is demonstrating that he has this power and this command over nature, over physical uh, well-being, illness, as well as over death. And it's building as we get to uh, Lazarus. And of course, this is also a precursor for what Jesus is going to do on the cross and not just on the cross, but his own personal resurrection, which is also then a precursor to our own death and eternity with Jesus. So it's a, a phenomenal um, piece of scripture. But let me uh, read the story, or part of it anyway, because it's quite a long story, uh, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. So Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they a family, and Jesus knows them all pretty well. And uh, Lazarus gets really sick, and Mary and Martha ask Jesus to come heal him. But let's just jump in here to verse 3. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, now this is really interesting. I mean, this is just like, he said what? Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Okay, now, I was thinking when I read this, who's actually hearing Jesus say this? Clearly, Martha and Mary didn't hear him say it because they sent a message. His disciples presumably heard it, but as is typical when Jesus is saying something pretty profound, it's like, what does he actually mean? 
and what did he actually say? And as is usual, they typically get like a part of what he's saying and not all of it. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days and did absolutely nothing about their pain and their problems. Finally, he said to his disciples, hey, let's go back to Judea. But the disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going to go there again? And then jumping to verse 11, Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he will, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sakes, I am glad I was not there, for now you will really believe. Come, let's go and see him. And then verse 11, Jesus arrived in Bethany and he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. I mean, the guy is dead, he's dead, dead, he's not just suffering from a headache, he's in the grave, it's four days. And then uh, verse 21, both Martha and Mary say the same thing. But Martha first, Jesus, if only, or Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, that's kind of an interesting and profound statement. They acknowledge, or she's acknowledging, that Jesus could have healed him, could have saved him. But even then, she's saying, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And so, like, okay, that's a pretty powerful prayer. What is it that you're going to ask for? And interestingly enough, uh, if we jump down to verse 32, Mary, who wasn't there when Jesus arrived, uh, says the same thing. Mary arrived and saw Jesus. She fell at his feet. Lord, if only you had have been here, my brother would not have died. They both realized that Jesus could have done something, and they're both expressing their disappointment, and not just disappointment, grief, that Jesus kind of let them down, and that he didn't do anything. So, back to 23, Jesus told her, your brother will rise again, talking to Martha. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And then Jesus says something very profound to her. I am, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And then jumping forward in the, in the story, we get to verse 33. Jesus saw that, uh, that she was weeping and saw that the other people were weeping and a deep anger welled up within him. And he was very deeply troubled. And he asked, Where's, where have they put Lazarus? They told him, Lord, come and see. Then this is very, very interesting and peculiar. One of the shortest sentences in the Bible. Jesus wept. It, it, it's really interesting. The people who were standing there nearby said, look, see how much he loved him. But anyway, he, he gets down and he gets to the grave. And then in verse 43, another one of the shortest sentences in the Bible Jesus commands Lazarus, who's dead, stinky, wrapped up in grave clothes, and he just commands him, Lazarus, come out. And after that, a bunch of people believe in Jesus, and the Pharisees decide to kill him. I mean, just, uh, just a phenomenal story. Uh, there's just so many uh, angles to this. But this idea that Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, Jesus is, is, is stating something here which is pr profound. He's basically saying, look, I created this world. 
as we saw in the beginning of the, the Gospel of John. He's not only saying that I created this world. He created the world from nothing. He put life into the world. Jesus is also saying, I am sustaining this world. And in doing that, Jesus is saying, I know what's best for you. I know what will make you the happiest. I know what will make this world run the best with the most amount of peace, with the most amount of satisfaction, and the most amount of joy. He's also saying, and I will raise people from the dead. And he clearly knows how to bring people back from the dead. Look, in John 1.10, he said, I came to this very world that he created, but the world didn't recognize him. And again in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is making these statements, but he's not just making the statements. He's demonstrating uh, that he does have the authority and the power over creation. Pause for a second and think about not only that, that Jesus is trying to uh, formulate our worldview and our thinking about who he is and about the kingdom of God and our participation in that and the fact that that is still happening to this day. And yet also in this story, we pick up that Jesus weeps. Look, this is actually for me very bizarre. I would have had the exact opposite uh, thought and, and reaction. Jesus just said in advance, hey, I'm going to raise J Lazarus from the dead. This is going to be like an incredible event. You would think like Jesus would be booking it into town. It's like, let's get to this thing. I mean, just watch this, people. Lazarus, come out. But no, he like, he starts crying. Wait, there's something we need to not miss in this. Jesus is fully human. Jesus understands pain and suffering. He doesn't just like ignore it. He doesn't just have some sort of like, you know, uh, some churches like, you just got to have faith and, and, and sort of ignore the reality. No, Jesus is saying, we need to pause when things are bad and we need to weep with those who weep. And this is really important. Look, when we have a funeral service, a memorial service, it's a very interesting uh, time when you do a memorial service with somebody who is a follower and a believer of Jesus. Because on the one hand, there's hope for the future that they will be resurrected and you will see them again. But on the other hand, it's deeply sad because the physical person is no longer there. And we need to pause and express that sadness. Uh, because if you don't, if you just say, oh, you know, uh, Jesus is going to rise again and this is all just great. I mean, that sadness will come out later at some other point. You can't suppress it. And that's what Jesus is acknowledging with Lazarus. He liked him. He loved him. He loved the family. And he's both mad because he's died and Jesus wants to conquer death. And he's sad because everybody else is sad. And yet, right after that, uh, Jesus just, uh, you know, overcomes uh, the last enemy to be destroyed is death, which we read in 1 Corinthians. And Jesus, you know, gives a pretaste to that. He shows it in Lazarus and he's going to demonstrate it himself. Um, the other thing that we kind of just need to pause on you for a brief second is just our understanding of heaven. Like when we die, this is not like we just go to the clouds and we have some sort of a Hindu mindset that our soul goes up there and our bodies are just meaningless. No, our bodies are holy. And the better picture, if you need a picture in your mind, would be like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where we're back in a recreated earth uh, for heaven. Uh, it's on this earth, reformed, recreated, in perfect harmony where we can have relationship with Jesus and relationship with each other. Uh, the body part is important. And so we just think about all these things when we deal with death. What does all of this have to do, say, with our current situation in Ukraine? I think Jesus is weeping about just, you know, all that's happening. I, I think there's something 
which really uh, kind of bothers us about this whole situation. Because we all uh, see what's happening in Ukraine and we say, God, like, do something. And we pray that God would do something. And yet again, God is trying to establish the kingdom of God in this place. He wants his world order, he wants his way to reign throughout this, this world. His world order, his way, his kingdom would be that people would be people passionate to follow him, particularly the Sermon on the Mount, particularly loving your enemies and loving each other. And if we would have this kind of a mindset, we wouldn't be doing the sort of things that we're doing in Ukraine, what Putin's doing in Ukraine. Now, one man, Putin, <clears throat> has now disrupted the whole world order, the whole supply chain, Everybody in the whole world is impacted by oil prices. But one man, Jesus, has the ability to restore this total world, and he will restore this total world at some point. The tension that we face is, why won't he do it right now? Jesus, why won't you uh, get involved in this world right now? But he is, Jesus, is the solution to the problem. I want to go on a little bit of a... Um, detour here, because I think there's a spiritual um, backdrop to this war, uh, or should I say, uh, if we can understand a little bit about the Russian Orthodox Church, we will see that Putin has kind of hijacked or used some of the, the, the church's uh, thinking to justify what he's doing. And because I'm not an expert in the Russian Orthodox Church, and I presume you aren't either, uh, it is helpful to just kind of get another window here. Uh, meaning this, Putin's used words like the Holy Rus, and this is Holy Land, and we're going to retake uh, Ukraine because it's our Holy Rus. Where is that coming from? What is that all about? Uh, let's just pause here for a second. Putin does not claim to have any religious uh, affiliation. He was an atheist. He was part of the KGB. You could not be a believer if you're part of the KGB. He became president. Uh, and then, according to some, he had some sort of a religious conversion. Not like we would think. But he became open to um, something other than just natural. And this had a weird impact because now, all of a sudden, He's interested in things like numerology, meaning numbers matter. And so he uh, invaded uh, Georgia on 8-8-2008, or 18. And he invaded Ukraine on 2 you know, this year, 22. So it's like all the twos. And apparently he gets like advice on this stuff. And he's open to like, okay, there's power in this. And it's kind of a little weird. That's what I mean by a conversion experience. But the bigger uh, important thing to actually understand, and I, uh, I was listening to a conversation by a guy by the name of Father Cyril Hoverin and another guy, Clifford Longley. Father Hoverin is an Orthodox uh, priest from Ukraine who understands the whole Orthodox system, understands the Russian Orthodox system. Uh, he's not I think he split out of the Russian Orthodox, but is still in the Orthodox Church. So, you know, he's an insider that can explain this. And uh, Longley is a, is a British journalist who specializes in the Russian Orthodox Church. And so they were uh, explaining something. They were saying, look, this is actually, this goes back a long way. It goes back a thousand years. In uh, 984 AD, another Vladimir, Vladimir the Great, converted to the Russian Orthodox Church. And the territory of the Russian uh, Orthodox Church or the Orthodox Church at that point was this. It was Ukraine being the center, Kiev being the center, Belarus and Russia. Moscow at that point was almost insignificant, if anything. And this territory became the Holy Rus. And so now, uh, fast forward, we got the, uh, this bishop or, or the pope uh, called the patriarch. So in the Orthodox Church, you've got several popes, different areas. Um, but you've got this guy, uh, Carol or Karel, but Cyril in English. 
He's the Russian Orthodox patriarch or, or pope, so to speak, based in, Ma uh, in Moscow, and all Rus, meaning this whole part of Ukraine. So now the church has a motive to keep this area, this territory as one. And his influence is over Ukraine and the Ukraine churches are under his domain. And when Putin got going in Georgia, uh, this started creating a problem within the church and the church split. And the church says, hey, listen, we're not into this, uh, you know, stuff. And so now there's extra motive from the Russian Orthodox patriarch who say, hey, hey, we need to keep everybody in the fold. And what Putin has done, he's jumped on this church agenda. He said, wait. And he pallied up with the church way back and gave him special dispensation. But now there's a problem, right? The church is stuck. It's like, okay, we've had all this favorable thing. Putin's hijacked, the th he's used our language. He's got the, the folks to say, yeah, this is our holy territory. And now, you know, uh, Patriarch Carol is like, yeah, but war? No, not so much. And he's been like dead, dead quiet. All that to say, uh, let's be focused here. The story ends well. Let's go back to Lazarus. Lazarus' story ends well. He is raised from the dead. Jesus' story ends well. Jesus raised himself, God the Father raised him from the dead. Our story is going to end well. We will be raised from the dead as followers and believers of Jesus. The problem that we deal with is the in-between time period. Why do we wait? Why is Jesus waiting? Why doesn't something happen? This is where the story is so helpful. Jesus didn't wait it for Lazarus. He didn't just heal him. It must have been excruciatingly painful for everybody. And it was excruciatingly painful. And we don't fully understand it. And uh, we see this in our own lives today. And Jesus has also decided to wait, which we don't fully understand. Jesus could have come, been born, and said, okay, I'm going to do what the Old Testament uh, predicted, uh, what Jewish people are still expecting. I'm going to come and I'm going to rule. I'm not going to die. I'm just going to take over the kingdom of God and put it in earth now, which is what everybody is hoping for. And Jesus says, no, I'm actually going to die on the cross, and I'm going to come back again later. Uh, and we get, we're in this period where we just wait. And it's like super frustrating for us because we don't fully understand it. And we live in this tension where we say, God, get involved in Ukraine, and then God, Jesus seems to be waiting. We say, God, get involved in our lives, and Jesus seems to be waiting. Yet in other times, Jesus does get involved and does supernatural things. And so we're like, okay, we, we want that today. We want that future to happen right now. We want Jesus to get involved. And so it's good that we pray. It's good. But what, you know, to bring these two thoughts together, the Shailene effect and, and what's happening in, with Putin. God is asking us to have a worldview, a kingdom of God uh, mindset. And he wants us to be thinking and living where he is, who he is, that we worship him, that we uh, believe in him, that we experience his love, and we live that out. And then there's the Shailene effect where that's a domino effect that other people also want to come uh, to know Jesus and live for him and experience that joy and that peace. He wants us to be making uh, disciples. Um, one of the worship team come on up. You know, and, and as we do that, as we live that out, I think uh, as we're going this Lent period where we start reflecting and saying, God, what is it that you're asking of me? What is it that you're saying uh, to me? And I think one of the things Jesus is saying to me is, the old repeated challenge is, do you love me? Will you live for me? Where are you? And so when we've experienced God's love and his joy, I just say, why is it such a problem for us when Jesus challenges us with our money? Why can't we tithe? Meaning, why will we resent giving God at least 10% of our gross income because that's a challenge that Jesus is presenting us. He's saying, I want you to do this. And at least 10% because this is New Testament. And Jesus is saying, 
I want you to make Sunday the Lord's day and to make this day holy. Will you live for me? Will you take one day out of the week and make it the Lord's day and make it holy? And we just struggle with these two factors. And Jesus is saying, look, it'll be best for you. I, I'm, I've designed this world. This is the way it'll run. It'll be best for you. But the best question of all is the question that, uh, that Jesus asked Mary and asked Martha specifically about the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Oh, Martha believed in Jesus. Martha believed. Jesus is asking her again. He said, do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe in me? And it's a question that I think we need to wrestle with. It's a question of, will we put our trust, our faith, will we follow Jesus in every way? Will we give him our lives? Will we say, Jesus, come in? But also, Jesus, do I believe in you with my money, with my time, with my lifestyle, with everything? And I think Jesus is challenging us with that. He's saying, if you want to have the best life possible, this is the way to do it. Or make it up on your own. Take another worldview. Take somebody else's opinion. And good luck to you. Why don't we just uh, stand and um, acknowledge this. Look, Jesus has given us uh, faith and facts. Faith is based on facts, but we do not have all the facts. Faith is based on facts, but we do not have all the facts. So we just ask Jesus to be powerful in our lives, to be relevant in our lives. And so Jesus says, look, we can put our worries, we can give him our concerns, we can give it to him, we can let it carry him. But let's have a worldview where Jesus is large and in charge. He can take care of Ukraine. He can take care of us. He can take care of our worries. And He can fill us with His joy. Jesus, we thank You that we can come here with the privilege of worshiping You and asking You to do the impossible, to change us, to change our lives, to give us Your joy and to give us Your hope. In Your name, Jesus. Amen.